So Gene, I, I've known you for years, just more from a distance. So I think my first interaction, I don't know, maybe it was at the impact hub here in Salt Lake several years ago Could have with, been. with Ross Baird, I think talking about some Vilcap funds and then again in Detroit. And right. Uh, Detroit. I remember well. Yeah. Yeah. So I, and I the Kentucky Derby right? and the Derby, there which was, go. which was, which was epic. <laughs> so, uh, everybody can read your bio. Um, I'm, I'm really kind of interested and curious what's not on your bio that, that you would really, you think is important or impactful for kind of how you think about the world. Sure. What your experiences have been, sure. uh, that maybe people oftentimes just don't know about, or maybe know about, but don't maybe consider as much as, as you do. Yeah. Well, you know, I think that there's some awareness that I'm a philanthropist and an investor and was in tech very early. Um, but I think a lot of people don't appreciate how my life pivoted in a dramatic way because, you know, I started out, I was born in this really small town called Normal. <laughs> and was it so very normal? It was very normal. <laughs> um, but my parents divorced when I was young. And so I was raised by a single mom, the youngest of four. Wow. Um, and so I literally started early life as a recipient of philanthropy. I was on a mm. full scholarship at a private school and then just had truly a tribe of people who just lifted me, mentored me, you know, really brought me along uh, and provided opportunity. So I think what maybe isn't so clear on my bio is, you know, it looks like this sort of perfect climb, but actually there were a series of pivots and failures along the yeah. way and, and really turning from sort of one part of life to another. And I love it because it's allowed me in the last several decades to really focus on trying to empower others because mm -hmm. others empowered me. And sometimes I don't think that comes through as clearly mm. on my bio. Yeah, for sure. Well, I was actually curious too, are there any experiences? So from your, from your early years that are like vivid in your mind yeah. that yeah. just kind of is stuck sure. and sure. Uh, it could be with your mom or it could be some sure. mentor that you mentioned. Sure. Well, you know, just given that sort of impact investing and startups are kind of what we share a little bit. Um, you know, my German immigrant grandparents came to America speaking no English not a dime in their pocket, and became entrepreneurs and uh, ultimately ended up having a, a hotel that they ran. And they used to let me stand wow. behind the counter of the hotel and greet guests and oh, try and fun. sell them things. <laughs> and I think my grandmother realized that when the kid was behind the desk, they did a lot more business. <laughs> so that was kind of fun. But another really transformative moment for me, um, I talked about sort of, you know, my journey through life of starting in one way and then mm -hmm. kind of ending up in kind of an elite privileged environment. But um, when I was in high school, I thought I was going to be a lawyer. Mm. And so I was given this uh, internship at uh, the with the local mayor, who then became a congressman. Um, but when I went into his law office, Bryce, that was really the first time in my life where I had seen professional people at work mm. because my dad was a long haul trucker. My mom was a waitress. Um, so I saw people in suits and I had seen people in suits, but mostly in church. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but I noticed like they conducted themselves differently. They spoke kind of in a different way or a different cadence in a yeah. professional environment. And it was really just all learning for me. And I've reflected many times on, well, what if they hadn't taken me under their wing? And what if I hadn't had that opportunity? Would I have learned early kind of some of the you know, almost soft skills that a lot of kids lack when they come out of a blue collar environment or a more challenging environment. Yeah. So that was definitely uh, a big moment for me. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, and it's, it's neat because really uh, interesting and humble upbringings, uh, it's something you're, you're very appreciative of. Oh, no question. Uh, but at the same time, you've gone on, you're a powerhouse. I mean, you look at, you're the chairwoman of the National Geographic. You are running the Case Impact Network. You're one of the lead folks at AOL early on in the day. Uh, you've done some amazing things, but it seems what's punctured or pointed at, at each of those things is this deep affection for people. That's right. And this deep affection for community. Right. So how, how did you take these like lessons from your grandparents, from, yeah. your, from your single mom way? Waitress right. and these mentors right. and kind of how do they become your own and and what would you define as some of these these values that you kind of care deeply about? Yeah, well, I think you know some of us have what we call kind of a north star mm. and um, or a true north. Yeah. Some call it. Uh, for me, it really is about empowering others. You know, it was as a kid if you know, I'd leave my working class neighborhood and go into this incredibly privileged private school environment, and I remember thinking then 
gosh, these people in my neighborhood have the same degree of talent and passion, and they work as hard or harder than I see these other people that I have grown to love. So what's the difference? And it became clear very early the difference was really opportunity. And so I think from a very young age, I knew that I would want to try to take whatever skills or gifts I had and really use them to try to bring more opportunity to more people in more places. And although that sounds, you know, what you, (laughs) my tech career, and then, you know, what we're doing around investing, and then my work at National Geographic, the common thread really is we're just trying to bring more opportunity to more people in more places with what Mm. we do. That's neat. Well, because it started with the Case Foundation, uh-huh. uh, and now you guys have shifted, which we'll kind of get to in a second. Yeah, we but, have. Uh, but early impressive work recognizing Thank okay, you. there's this there's this new field that's come onto the scene. People have been doing it for centuries, right? The Quakers yes. were early in this idea of impact, alignment, values. You know, Catholic Milton, Church, was? Catholic Church. Yeah. You know, so down you know, faith faith communities of all stripes have, yeah. have been participating in that's this. Right. Uh, then you get to Mount Milton Friedman's in the 1970s. It yeah. kind of uh, I'll alter that. Yeah, kind uh, of a left turn exa- in there. <laughs> but then you come on the scene with with others, but recognize okay, there's this there's this new interest, a new generation of young people yeah. and and old people. They're w- waking up and saying, "Well, wait a minute, life is more fulfilling yes. than just putting more dollars in my bank account." Yeah. You you kind of had the foresight to say, "Hey, we need to build this field. Like, uh, if we don't." It's going to be this good idea that goes nowhere. I think that's right. And, you know, as you point out, Bryce, so we've been deeply focused in the realm of impact investing. And, you know, for us, we define impact investing as, you know, needing to have three things present, intentionality, measurement, and transparency so that people understand the impact you're setting out to have. So that's really been a key area of focus for us. And we're super excited there about the momentum in that space and Mm -hmm. how it's growing. Um, You know, we may cross a trillion dollars in assets under management and impact investing this year. We'll see, but could be. Um, And then, you know, we see a growing interest in this broader area of ESG Mm -hmm. where there's 20 trillion in assets. But then we turn around and look at communities across the United States and frankly across the world, and we see sort of two different pictures, right? We see people who've been able to participate in the economy, people who've been able to bring prosperity, but then, you know, many find it elusive. Mm. And so I think our pivot really has been to look at the broader questions around how do we build an economic system, you know, which is capitalism that we celebrate here in America and how do we make sure we adapt it so that it meets more people in more places and provides more opportunity to people in more places and I think that's kind of how our our uh, focus has shifted somewhat you know we we're following you know what we're seeing and hearing out there and sometimes you know we're playing around in December with different things as we talked about this work and I said do you hear what I hear because if you look at research you know, Pew came out with some research last year, and a third of the people said they have a negative, in, in America, a third of the people said they have a negative view of capitalism, and 41% said they have a positive view of socialism. Oh, goodness. The global study is even worse that Edelman did in terms of trust. That said, 51% said that capital does more harm than mm. good. And one in three people said they don't believe they'll be better off five years from now than they are today. So, you know, I think the time has come where, like all systems, we have to look at our system and see how it needs to be yeah. adapted to just work better and work for more people in more places. Yeah, that's interesting. There's a, there's a gentleman, I name escapes me, but he kind of coined this phrase that I think is really appropriate for the work that you do. Uh, and it was early on, like at SOCAP, Kevin Jones, he would use this phrase like community quarterback, who's, who's re-engineering the system, who's thinking at a more systems right. level. That's a great way to put it. But then there was this other phrase that I think is really more appropriate as a, an economic system is like a systems entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. So you think about like uh, systems engineers, right? Yeah. How they're looking and working across fields of, of expertise and bringing things together. Uh, you're really a pioneer, it seems. As a, as a systems entrepreneur, recognizing like, hey, we can't just do grants, right. can't just do investments that are impactful, and then this other ESG thing. How do we look across the entire spectrum of capital right. to, if, if, the, if the goal is changed communities, more opportunity? Absolutely okay. right. And you know, I would add policy to that, policy, right? Yep. Because in almost anything we've done, we've asked the questions about, you know, we're in Washington, D.C., you know, we can walk to the White House from our offices. <laughs> And we, you know, have worked with most administrations in the past across 
you know, across the aisles. So, um, no, we think policy will play an important role here as well. But, you know, the funny thing to me is that it's a little bit like Back to the Future, because I just recently was with Ginny Rometty, who is, of course, CEO of IBM. She just announced she's going to be stepping down, but a real celebrated CEO in America of a great company. You know, IBM's over 100 years old, and they have a serious track record of really focusing on a number of stakeholder groups that mm. they know help make them successful. You know, they were the earliest in terms of, you know, really having a broad uh, and wide embrace of different kinds of employees long before others were, whether that was gender, whether that was race. They were activists during the civil rights m- movement. I could go right down mm-hmm. the line. And, you know, she said, and I totally agree with her, she's like, talk to any company that's like 100 years old or more, and they'll tell you that was our playbook to mm-hmm. be focused on a multiple set of stakeholders, our employees, our customers, the local community, right? And so it's not exactly a new radical idea. We just kind of got off. We we lost sight of that. (laughs) Yeah, we got a little off the mark for a few decades as we only focused on shareholder return. So now I think we just, you know, shareholder return has to remain such an important focus Mm -hmm. and a central focus for companies. But I think we're selling ourselves short if we don't think we can do shareholder return at a great rate and and do more and serve more people. So going back to impact investing, so one of the one of the questions I I've always been fascinated about is this this idea of impact investing. This is this modifier of right. impact. Do you do you think it's ever appropriate or the goal to drop that modifier? Yeah, that's and that, my hope is that okay. all, all investing will be impact investing. Um, and by the way, I do believe you know as we've said many times in this movement, all investing does have impact. Mm. It does. The question is, what impact does it have? And I think I had to learn this in a very real way because I'd had this portfolio that I'd kept, an investment portfolio from my days back in AOL. Um, and I decided, okay, you know, I've been talking a lot about impact investments. We've been making impact investments. But what if I take this portfolio and take it to 100% impact? So, of course, job one was, well, what's in that now? Because I have, you know, wealth advisors that help yeah. me. And I was kind of horrified to see what I believed was impact I didn't intend to have because I just hadn't been paying attention to some of the things and some of the funds, et cetera. So I feel really great today about the, you know, the path that portfolio is on. But I think for a lot of people, it's really important to, to just start out realizing that wherever your capital, if you're a consumer or if you're an investor, wherever you're placing your bets or putting your capital, it's having impact. You should understand the impact it's having. How do we, how do we shift? Uh, so I live in Louisville, Kentucky, so mid America, uh, and I think Louisville is more representative of the nation than yeah. than the coastal. Louisville is a great town, by the way. Yeah, well, thank you. I think we're so. big champions. <laughs> of Louisville. But I think what we ros- wrestle with are a lot of similar issues, right? We we have this this massive gap of risk capital for early stage entrepreneurs. Uh, we have. Uh, economic development solutions that really service venture capital backed backable companies versus the, uh, the main street businesses. Right. We, we bifurcate our approaches. Right. And then we also have foundations that haven't yet, the, the staff all want to go in the direction of impact. Right. Because they, they've, they've drank the Kool-Aid, they've come right. to conferences, but the power brokers yes. are these investment committees and these boards. No question. Chief investment officers oh my are goodness. big time gatekeepers when how, it comes to where the resources are going to go. How do, how, what would you say to a community like Louisville? What, what are some ways that we can aggressively be catalytic and moving the needle to, to take, like in Louisville, for example, $1.2 billion under management in the foundations. Right. That's a lot of money it Park, is. parked on, on the, on wall street. It and is. so getting them to think sure. differently about their money. Sure. Well, you know, maybe I'll just use national geographic society oh, as please. an example here, because we have interestingly a $1.2 billion endowment. Oh, that's, <laughs> national that's great. Geographic, <laughs> the size of Louisville's. Um, and you know, for 132 years, we've been investing in, you know, just audacious explorers and scientists mm. out there on the front lines of the unknown, really trying to, you know, push the envelope of innovation, push kind of almost, you know, into new territory. Um, And we've cared deeply about our planet as well, conservation and pulling forward important issues that are affecting our planet. And then, you know, we turned around when I became chair and said, hmm, so what's in that 1.2 billion where we make investments every day? And there wasn't alignment between the mission of our organization Mm. and what we've been doing for 132 years and how we're spending our money 
over on the endowment part, which is $1.2 billion. So we immediately adopted an impact investing focus. Uh, we started with toe in the water, saying we'll take 5% of our endowment so that we could bring people along. And the reason that I use that as an example, Bryce, is in working with a number of foundations and endowed institutions across the country. What we've said is, you know, can you take a toe in the water mm. approach? Can you try? Can you apportion a small amount to begin understanding what does this look like? What are the opportunities? You know, additionally, there's a overwhelming, compelling set of data to suggest that across asset classes, mm. and we found this true at uh, National Geographic, our impact investments are often outperforming their counterparts in the same asset class. So I think just making sure people know the data out there, because there is this great myth, and I've written about it many times, that if you're looking for impact, you're gonna it's going to be concessionary mm -hmm. in your return. And the data is very clear from the most respected you know, financial analysts and research houses that, if anything, impact generally represents an outperformance. Yeah, no doubt. And that's that kind of uh, that's part of the hurdle, I think, too, because it's like we have all this data now, right? Fifteen right. years at least of like where it outperforms. Right. We've got family foundations and right. high net worth individuals that are putting their money where their mouth is right. and, and going in this direction. Right. What are the hurdles that you see that we still need to kind of overcome? for more kind of mainstream adoption. Yeah, so let me talk about a couple of ways we've tried to sort of fill some what, what we see as gaps out mm -hmm. there, opportunities to bring people along. One of the first things we did was publish something called a short guide to impact investing. And boy, that thing has been used in more places we than use we it. could have ever <laughs> dreamed, okay? Um, but that really is a primer, right? It's a great conversation starter. Like, what are we talking about here? And what are some examples of impact investing? But then we also realized, you know, there is a broad ecosystem out there. What we see with some CIOs who are very skeptical or organizations that are fearful is we really needed to unveil the broad ecosystem that exists today. So we put uh, something called the Impact Investing Network Map out. It's a visualization tool that lets you see where investors are, where they're investing. You can search it by sector. You can search it by you know geography. You name it. Um, and we have, I think the the latest number is something like fifteen to twenty billion in assets that we're tracking of investments that have gone forward. And the idea of that is, look, this isn't something that just dropped out of the sky yesterday. There's a real marketplace at work here and yeah. a lot of really credible people who are in and making investments and feeling really good about the returns on those. That's awesome. So then getting to the Case Impact Network. So mm -hmm. formerly Case Foundation now kind of rolling it up new Right. New kind of aggressive, it sounds like, and an exciting future. So pivoting to this economic system change yeah. for the future. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that, about that and what excites you about, about the future. Sure. Well, I think, you know, anyone looking uh, at trends should see that there is growing momentum. You know, the Business Roundtable, which represents the largest firms in the United States, the largest companies, their CEOs sit on the Business Roundtable um, and last August, they put out a redefinition of the purpose of business. Okay? Which because, is not a small thing. Which is not a small thing. And trust me, it was no small deal to get 181 CEOs agreeing on what that statement would be. But in a nutshell, it took us from believing that the only purpose, or stating the only purpose of business was a return to shareholders, to saying, no, the purpose of business is to serve many stakeholders that help make that business successful. And, you know, the super exciting thing there is we're seeing companies like Airbnb, naturally a new generation company doing sure. it first, but Airbnb coming forward and saying they're going to have a stakeholder committee on their board. And more importantly, they're going to change our compensation levels for their employees to basically reward more stakeholder service, if you will. Oh, so interesting. thinking about the customer or thinking about, you know, what it takes to make a positive employment. As opposed to just sales type orientation. As opposed orientation. to just profits. That's yep. exactly right. So profits remain a big part of sure. the focus, of course. But they, as a new generation company, are saying, hey, we can walk and chew gum too. Yeah. We can actually have profits and serve our stakeholders better and we'll be a stronger company in the long run. Yeah. And it reminds me of kind of Wendell Berry has talked a lot about total co uh, true cost accounting. Right. So like exactly. when you say profit, uh, yeah. we immediately think financial. Right. But if we reimagine profit, right. what does that mean for a community well, and people? Yeah, and, and in the realm of sustainability and climate change, it's becoming you know, clearer and clearer that companies that are really ta tackling those issues today 
are mitigating future risk. Yep. So they will be rewarded in terms of where investors will place their bets because, yep. you know, at the end of the day, it's all about risk and reward when you're, you know, placing your bets as an investor. And those companies that are mitigating it by dealing with issues today that could otherwise affect them in the future, mm-hmm. I think really in, in the end, those will be the winning companies. Yeah, mitigating risk, creating a, a greater work environment. No question. And providing more opportunities for people that, didn't have those That's historically. Right. So I think those are beautiful. Yeah. Well, you know, Bryce, I mean, <laughs> this new generation, millennials, the largest workforce yeah. in American history. Um, and, you know, they just want to see things done differently mm-hmm. than their parents and grandparents did them. And CEOs are well aware that to attract and retain best in class talent, they're going to have to adapt their practices to meet yeah. more people in more places.